The Catechism speaks of the Holy Spirit in the teaching of the faith. In other words, how the church has articulated the doctrine of the faith regarding the mystery of the Trinity. Now, the formulation of the Trinitarian dogma has uh, an interesting history. Uh, the early church, in fact, the Church of the Apostles, has a consciousness of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is enough for St. Paul uh, to express the concepts, uh, the persons of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, there's a sense in which uh, there's a great appreciation for Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even if there is an inadequate theological reflection on it. In the early church, we have persecuted Christians. It was enough to say, Jesus is Lord, to be martyred. In other words, someone who said simply, Jesus is Lord, that person could be arrested and thrown in jail and tortured and put to death, earning the martyr's crown. The early Christians were interested in expressing their belief in the Trinity, not necessarily explaining it. When things settled down, when the church under Emperor Constantine was first legalized in 313, and then when it became the official religion of the empire in 315, then when things were settled and peaceful, then theological reflection uh, took place, and there was a great desire to try to express more thoroughly what the church means by saying God, one God in three persons. From the beginning, the revealed truth of the Holy Trinity has been at the very root of the church's living faith. The greetings of St. Paul. St. Paul uses a Trinitarian greeting, one that we sometimes hear in the sacred liturgy. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Uh, in the early centuries, the church sought to clarify its Trinitarian faith both to deepen its own understanding and to defend the faith against errors. It was important that the church be clear about the faith because there were errors circulating, heresies in the early church. This was accomplished, uh, this deepening understanding, this was accomplished through the work of the councils, through the theological work of the fathers of the church, and was sustained through the census fidei, uh, we spoke about this earlier, the census fidei, the Christian people's sense of the faith. The early Christians were the relatives of martyrs, and they wanted to preserve. They were conservative in their approach to the content of the faith. They didn't want anyone to change the faith that came to them from the apostles, nor should we. This is why the church to this day is very precise in expressing doctrine. This is why the church has published the work that we are studying, the catechism of the Catholic Church. The church developed its own terminology with the help of certain notions of philosophical origin, notions such as substance, person, hypostasis, relation, the church employed the language of philosophers in order to better articulate her faith in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The church gave a new and unprecedented meaning to these terms, which from then on would be used to signify an ineffable mystery, infinitely beyond all that we can understand. In many cases, the church took words that were previously used by pagan philosophers and by using them and applying them to the Trinity, gave those words new and unprecedented meaning. Such as the word for substance, ousios, known as essence or nature. This is used to designate the divine being in its unity. Uh, the word hypostasis, 
which is translated as person, used to designate the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and the real distinction between them. This is a different usage from the modern notion of person, in which the person is an autonomous center of action, the center of consciousness and freedom. God does not have three centers of being, but is essentially one. The church fathers use the term relation, uh, such as procession, generation, inspiration, used to designate the fact that the distinction between the persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, lies in the relationship of each to the other. Uh, the Trinity is one God in three consubstantial persons. Each is God, whole and entire. The divine persons are really distinct from one another. They are not modalities or ways of action uh, in the sense in which one human person, one man, could be both father and son and husband and scholar or plumber or carpenter and the like. This isn't how we speak of the distinction between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And um, from time to time, people will get into trouble when they try to replace the names Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with other names. Uh, for a while, it was uh, in vogue to speak of um, the, the Creator and the Redeemer and the Sanctifier. And some uh, illicitly would change the formulation of the sign of the cross by saying, in the name of the Creator and of the Redeemer and of the Sanctifier. Now, yes, God is Creator, but the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all have a role to play in creation. God is Redeemer. And the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have a role to play in redeeming and in sanctifying. It, we must stay with the language of faith, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and not reduce those sacred names to functions or to the work that they each accomplished. This distinction lies in their relation of origin. The Father generates the Son is begotten, the Holy Spirit proceeds. The divine persons are relative to one another, distinct persons, but not divided. Their distinctiveness resides solely in the relationships which relate them to one another. In just a few words, I have said a lot, and uh, there are entire courses on theology devoted to these distinctions. Uh, we don't have to understand everything, but we should appreciate the fact that the brightest minds in the church down through the ages have expressed faith in the, tri in the Trinity in very cogent and intelligent manner, uh, a, a manner that has stood the test of time and a manner that serves us well. The Catechism speaks of the divine works and Trinitarian mission, or how by the divine mission of the Son and the Holy Spirit, God the Father fulfills the plan of His loving goodness of creation, redemption, and sanctification. God freely wills to communicate the glory of His blessed life. Such is the plan of His loving kindness conceived by the Father before the foundation of the world in His beloved Son. St. Paul will say in the letter to the Ephesians, he will express it in this way, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavens as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, to be holy and without blemish before him. In love, he destined us for adoption to himself through Christ Jesus, in accord with the favor of his will. This whole plan that God has for us unfolds in creation, in the history of salvation, and in the mission of the Son and the Holy Spirit, which are continued 
in the mission of the church. The divine economy is the common work of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I use this word economy, and the church uses this word economy. It's an important word. It has to do with many things coming together. When we think of economy today, we think of how one aspect of human endeavors influences the others. Uh, that when housing sales are up and housing construction is up, it means there's more money for people to buy cars and other products. One sector influences the other, and the economy today is, uh, is a, a quite the intricate web of its various sectors. So too do we speak of the divine economy, the work of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Each divine person performs the common work according to his unique personal property. The divine missions of the Son's incarnation and the gift of the Holy Spirit show forth the properties of the divine persons. The whole Christian life is a communion with each of the divine persons without in any way separating them. We can distinguish, but we may never separate. We distinguish between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit their identity, their nature, their work, but we do not separate. We distinguish, we do not separate. The ultimate end of the whole divine economy is the entry of God's creatures into the perfect union of the Most Blessed Trinity. The whole purpose of the divine economy is so that we might share in the life of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for all eternity. Even now, we are called to be a dwelling for the Most Holy Trinity. Whoever loves me will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him, and we will make our dwelling with him. From the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 23. We speak in the creed of God the Father, the Almighty. The Almighty. What does this word mean? God's omnipotence is named in the creed, and that quality uh, is unique uh, because it speaks of God's universal power. God does whatever he pleases, and nothing is impossible with God. Who can withstand the might of his arm? That's from the book of Tobit, quoted in paragraph 269. God's power is abundant. God's power is universal. God does whatever he pleases. And God's power is loving and merciful. God is Father by being omnipotent and by calling us to adoption as his sons and daughters in Christ. God's fatherhood is shown forth in his infinite mercy by freely forgiving sins. But what about the problem of evil and God's apparent powerlessness? God seems incapable of stopping evil. When we think about the evening news, when we think of natural evil, uh, earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, and we think of the evil perpetrated by human beings one against another. Uh, we, like the people of the scriptures, cry out, How long, O Lord? How long will you leave us like this? When will you step in, dear Lord? When will you put a stop to all of this? And this causes for many people a crisis of faith wondering how God could possibly let this evil transpire. God the Father revealed his almighty power in the voluntary humiliation and resurrection of his Son, by which he conquered evil. Christ crucified is thus the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Thus we can speak of the permissive will of God. 
God permitted even his only begotten Son to suffer greatly and to die upon the cross. God permits natural evil and God permits human beings to exercise their free will even when that results in great suffering and anguish. Through it all, we find our consolation in the cross. And this is why at a time of illness, we look to the cross. In a Catholic hospital, for example, the crucifix, which is normally placed at the head of a person's bed, is placed at the foot of the bed on the wall so that a person from the hospital bed who is suffering can gaze upon the suffering Christ and therein find meaning in suffering and therein gain an insight into the problem of evil and the, the problem of God's seeming powerlessness in the face of evil. Only faith can embrace the mysterious ways of God's almighty power. The Blessed Mother is the supreme model of this faith. Nothing is more apt to confirm our faith and hope than holding it fixed in our minds that nothing is impossible with God. Once our reason has grasped the idea of God's almighty power, it will easily and without any hesitation admit everything that the creed will afterward propose for us to believe, even if they be great and marvelous things far above the ordinary laws of nature. And much more will be said about God's powerlessness when we study God's providence at a later point in the Catechism. We speak of God the Father, the Almighty, and the Creator the creator of heaven and earth. Creation, uh, the first words of sacred scripture have to do with creation. Uh, the book of Genesis, uh, and the word Genesis, by the way, means in the beginning, which just happened to be the first words of that very book. In the beginning, God created. Creation is the beginning of salvation history the history that culminates in Christ. Christ sheds light on creation and reveals the end for which in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And liturgically, uh, the Easter Vigil uh, begins the Liturgy of the Word with the account of creation. We will study more about creation in the subsequent section of the Catechism.